Good evening. It's wonderful to welcome you all here tonight. Did you hear in the hallway someone going, da 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 Must be Shark Week. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome. Uh, well, let's get started with the uh, technology spotlight. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could drive cars with just water for the fuel, you know? Well, wouldn't it be more amazing if we could just have the water drive all by itself? <laughs> well, some researchers at the university, the City University of Hong Kong, have found a new way to propel water with no additional energy. And let me show you what I mean. So, uh, this is an example. See how the water moves all by itself? Well, this actually will work uphill. In fact, it'll work straight up. You see the water? And it'll also even work upside down. There it goes again. Let's try a little bit bigger one. There we go. Now, the way that they do this is with a surface that repels water. It's a super, uh, let's see if I can say it, super amphiphobic surface. Yeah. Ugh, mouthful. It'll repel water or oil. It's a really amazing thing. When the water sits on that surface, it looks like a little bubble. Then they create a charge gradient across that surface. Remember, a charge is the number of electrons, right? So the area that has more electrons will attract the water, and the water will move across the surface towards that area. It's pretty cool. Uh, but how do they program it? Turns out that they can have it go in a straight line, or they can have it do a curve, and of course, uh, upside down or up a surface. Well, the way that they program it is actually really simple. Check this out. So all they do is drop water from varying heights. Every time a drop of water hits the surface, it leaves electrons behind. And the higher you drop the water from, the more electrons it leaves behind. So they do a process like this where they run the, the drops of water across the surface, and it creates a charge gradient. And then it will work for hours. In fact, in some cases, for 20 hours, 30 hours, where every time the water droplets hit it, they get repelled across the path. Now, there are, they also found out that this will work for uh, other liquids, like blood. And so this is going to be really useful for what we call a lab in a chip. This is a device where all the different pieces you need in a laboratory to do a test are within a single chip. And this makes it so you can do a lot of tests, like blood tests, DNA sequencing, and um, maybe food analysis all inside of a chip. So that's really cool. But some of you are probably wondering, well, what about the car? <laughs> There's more. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so they actually use the same thing to propel a little vehicle. And the wheels are made out of water. So this vehicle is literally running on water. <laughs> uh, but probably the most uh, exciting part to me is not this new technology, but what we don't know about this new technology. It turns out that when the droplets hit the surface and leave electrons, exactly how that works is not fully understood. If we could understand that all the way, then it might open new doors for new power generation and water collection out of the air, and technologies like that. Pretty exciting stuff. Well, that's all the tech we have the time for. Tune in next week if you want to see more. All right. Now it's time for Breakthroughs in Science with Tobias. All right. Well, good evening. So tonight's question I have is what point is it that you get to in a project where you're trying to create something new or invent something that you decide, okay, it's time to not do this anymore because it's impossible. We're going to talk about something that was pretty impossible, pretty much across the board, everyone had decided it was impossible. We're talking about something called caucha. That sounds like a really magical tea from the islands or something, <laughs> but uh, actually it is a magical something from mostly in Brazil, but from South America. And it's something that the Indians way, way back in the day had pulled out of trees. It was this sap stuff. 
and they had found that it had really interesting and magical properties. They could even mold it into a ball and it would bounce. So it's starting to sound a little bit familiar. When the Europeans came over, they saw Indians playing with these bouncy balls and they actually took some back over to Europe and it was like this magical substance that the new land had and the Indians called it caoutchouc. And eventually it would be named rubber and that was because one of the chemists who studied it said that you could actually rub off writing on a paper. So that's how rubber, uh, yeah, get you some rubber. Well, this guy, his name's Charles, he's in the 1800s and he happens to go to this rubber shop right when rubber was the craze. Everyone was so excited because it wasn't just bouncy, but it was flexible, it could repel water. You could make something waterproof with this. Basically, you could put this coating of this rubber and transform something. So he goes to this rubber shop, basically, and they had these vests that were rubber. They were kind of like life vests that you could blow up. And he had some ideas on how to improve the little nozzle where you blow up the vest, and he comes back to this place a while later, and the manager tells him, mm, I'm sorry, I mean, what you have is a good idea, but it, we're not interested anymore. He's like, well, what happened? Well, recently, uh, in the dead of night, me and a couple other guys went and buried some stuff. Oh, sounds like a murder confession or something. They went and buried $20,000 worth of rubber products that had been returned by very, very unhappy customers because the problem with rubber was that in winter it would crack, get hard and break. And in summer it would get even worse because it would get sticky and start melting and it smelled really, really bad. That's why they would actually bury it because it smelled so bad. So the, the huge magical substance all of a sudden disappeared. Everyone gave up on it. And several people tried again with a new idea on it and they gave up. Well, this is when Charles decided to take this on. He was sure there, there was a way we could transform rubber, maybe chemically or just with some kind of a substance that would make rubber usable. So he decides, okay, I'm gonna take this on. So he's sure if we do some kind of a powder mixture, then maybe that'll get it less sticky, make it something you could actually work with. So he works on several things. He goes home and right when he gets home, he gets thrown in jail. Back in the, yeah, back in the day, you could be put in jail in what they called a debtor's prison, basically for just being in debt. So he's put in prison. His first thing is asks to see his wife, and he says, can you get me some rubber and a roller? Um, it's like, yeah, I love you too. Uh, but so he starts working in prison on this idea. He starts mixing different things, and he ends up spending pretty much all of his time on this and all of their belongings, actually. When he finally gets home, he sells things all over the place just to get more you know, experimentation equipment. And he's using all their pots. He's mixing rubber with anything he can find. Different things to see if it will change the substance. Um, okay, let's sell the furniture, sell the textbooks, sell the china. Well, we'll keep the china. We could use that at night for mixing. That's a true story. Um, so they kept the china. And finally, he did find something that was really interesting, and it was nitric acid. He mixed nitric acid, and it changed. It seemed to be less sticky. It seemed to be more workable and then hold its, its shape. So he jumps on this and he starts actually going forward with some products, trying it. He even gets a, a, a contract from the post office in Boston to make waterproof mail bags. So he produces waterproof mail bags. Well, unfortunately, summer came and the rubber did not hold up and it melted. Really sad, I, can, I would hate to be pulling letters out of there. Um, <laughs> a big sticky mess and it stank and it was not good. And this happened over and over again. You think you have something, but then it gets hot or then it gets cold. So once you get it, you gotta try it in heat. You gotta try it in cold, see how it works. Well, he's working more on this. We're talking like years are going by and he's, he's in prison, he's out of prison, he's back in prison because he didn't pay a $5 hotel um, bill. Lots of different things. Um, things are different now apparently. But finally, and this is the part where we don't really know exactly what happened, but he was trying different things, and one of the things he had tried, he had tried cottage cheese, he had tried everything. It's a dog, put it in. Um, <laughs> finally, he tried sulfur, and it, it seemed to sort of work, but not really, and one of the versions of the story is that he was very frustrated with some people who were making fun of it, and he took it and slapped it on the, the fire grill, Another one is that he tripped and it fell on the fire grill. Another one, probably his version, I had an idea. But <laughs> however it happened, 
it got on the fire grill. And, you know, okay, it's going to get hot, it's going to melt. Oh, no. He goes over and picks it up, and it, the opposite happened. It got hard. And he realized, whoa, this is different. And eventually he would discover that through heating the rubber with the sulfur mixed in, it transformed the properties of that rubber into something that was completely different. And he would spend the next several years figuring out the exact amount, or the perfect amount, hopefully, uh, of heat and how to do it. He did all kinds of things to find and test how to heat it. And eventually he would discover that high pressure steam at really high temperatures was the best way that he could find to do this. So he invents this way of creating a rubber that is transformed into something you could use, like on a shoe, like on tires, like on fittings. It transformed everything. He needed a name. This is new. So what are you going to name this? Well, he decided to name it after the god of fire, Vulcan. This is not Star Trek. Um, so he called it vulcanized rubber. And so that is what vulcanized rubber came from. And unfortunately, for a lot of the rest of his life, he did um, was occupied by fighting some patent royalty issues that people had. But this would go to change everything in not just you know how these could be used to keep something waterproof, to keep something durable, but from the point of view of now we can have rubber fittings. Just that alone would change everything in the industrial world, industrial world. So Charles, oh, and his last name's Goodyear. Um, yeah, throw that in. No, he did not start the tire company. Um, 50, year, 50 years after he passed away, a company was created, and in honor of him, they named it Goodyear. So Charles Goodyear, um, a rough, rough adventure to get to where he got. But not giving up, and however, whichever story you want to go with, getting it on the heat and finding a breakthrough that would change the world. Thank you. All right, and now introducing Dr. Roger Billings. Thank you, sir. It rubbed me wrong. No. I have something really fun to talk about tonight. Um, just a quick uh, rehearsal, though, of the things we've already discussed. Hydrogen car, hydrogen bus, hydrogen homestead, hydrogen tractor, hydrogen mail delivery. We've, we've done a lot of hydrogen things over the years, haven't we? But you know, I think it's time to try something we've never done before. How would you like to see a hydrogen-fueled angel? <laughs> this is an electrolyzer. It has a polyperfluorinated membrane in it. It's got a little battery here. If you put water in, turn on the button, this thing will generate hydrogen. And the hydrogen will bubble up through the water, infusing hydrogen into the water. And then the hard part is to infuse the water into the angel. <laughs> Let's see how we do. We should have music for this, should we? In Joe's Sharks. Stainless steel lid. Ordinary water. So what is it going to do to me? <laughs> if we knew the outcome, it wouldn't be an experiment, would it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I trust you, so. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the little switch here. All right, now, for those of you that have the $5 seats, you can see the little bubbles. Can you see that? Bubble, 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 bubble. So we are infusing molecular hydrogen into the water. Doesn't seem like a big deal. It just might be. This could be one of the biggest crazes to hit this year, maybe in a lot of years. Hydrogen is a pretty amazing fuel. It's the most abundant element in the universe. 55% of the atoms in your body are hydrogen. Hydrogen makes up two-thirds of the ocean, a little oxygen impurity. <laughs> but here, we're talking about 
dissolving hydrogen in water. And it's true that you can dissolve a very, very small amount of a gas in a water. Like oxygen dissolved in the ocean is how fish breathe. They breathe the dissolved oxygen out with their gills. The amount of hydrogen that we can dissolve is only about one and a half part per million. That's not very much, or about one and a half milligrams per liter. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of hydrogen in the water. But as it dissolves, hydrogen is odorless, it's flavorless, so it's not going to add a lot of flavor, good or bad, to the water. But it does do something really interesting. I'm going to, what do you think, is that pretty well charged up? I'm going to ask Angel if she'll just uh, taste this for me. Hydrogen-infused water. How do you feel? Very good so far. Now, how does it taste, though? Does it taste like water? What does it taste like? It tastes like water. It's a little better than water to me, though. Better than water? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And you're still feeling okay? So far, so then good. Then I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> like the king's test is right there. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hydrogen. In 2007... A medical paper was published in, in Japan from a scientist that had been studying human cells. Inside every cell of the body, there's a little engine, a little fuel cell called mitochondria. That is where the cell generates energy that it needs to do its function, to keep it warm, to do, if it's a muscle, to power the muscle. And this particular researcher was an expert in my, my, mitochondria. He had been looking for ways to get rid of uh, chemicals that build up in the cell when the cell generates power. And these chemicals are very harmful to the operation of the cell and in fact can make them sick or even kill the cells. Antioxidants are substances that get rid of these oxidant chemicals. And so one of the things he decided to try was hydrogen, elemental hydrogen. And when he did, he noticed something very interesting. Not only did it get rid of these radicals, but it did so selectively. Some of these free radicals are necessary for life. They're pretty important. And while some things will destroy all of them, hydrogen was selective. Long story short, here we are... Uh, since 2007, 700 papers have been published in medical journals about this phenomena. And it's the hottest craze right now in Hollywood. It's been very, very big in Japan and it's spreading around the world. It's drinking hydrogen water. And as the guy that Time Magazine once referred to as Dr. Hydrogen, didn't take very long for someone to call me up and ask me about it. <laughs> so what about that hydrogen water? And I said, what? <laughs> so I started doing some research. And it has been very, very interesting. A lot of the diseases facing our society today are because of inflammation. And this inflammation is caused by this very reason. The worst of these chemicals that build up inside the cell are the hydroxyl ion, hydroxyl's OH. If you take a hydroxyl ion and add a hydrogen atom, it turns this nasty radical into water. And that's a good thing for it to be. Now, this kind of a problem can explain cancer, autism, Diabetes, high cholesterol, I mean the list goes on and on. It's all the same problem manifesting itself in different parts of the body. If you want to do something kind of fascinating, go look on YouTube at the reports and the research that's being reported now about consuming hydrogen water. 
it's really, really a craze. Uh, I acquired this proton exchange membrane electrolyzer, something that I helped pioneer in the 70s. I found it on Amazon. Also found it on eBay. Also found it at Walmart. And there's umpteen different brands. If you decide to try one, and I think you probably should, be sure and get one that has glass. The plastic ones have a problem. And, and I'd also recommend that you get the stainless steel trim. Probably most important is the fact that it's a solid polymer electrolyte kind of a device. It, it's interesting, uh, years ago I was invited to go to India because there was a plant there that had a large amount of hydrogen. They were just venting into the atmosphere and they wanted me to figure out what to do with it. It's a big plant. So I traveled to India and this plant made PVC pipe which is polyvinyl chloride, which is made then primarily out of chlorine gas. Now chlorine, you know, is a very poisonous gas. But chlorine is also half of table salt. When it's in the form of table salt, it's not poisonous. When you break it up, then it's, it's very dangerous. The way that you produce chlorine is by electrolyzing salt water. If you run water into an electrolyzer, put a current across it with two electrodes, you'll get hydrogen off one electrode and oxygen off the other one. But if you just add salt to the water, then you get chloride ions, then you still get hydrogen off of one side, but the other side you get chlorine gas. That's great if you're trying to make PVC. It's not great if you're trying to make something for Angel to drink. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <laughs> some of the electrolyzers are putting the product, the oxygen, right into the cell. You've got to be a little bit careful of that because if your water has some salt in it, some chloride, well then it will produce chlorine. So if you do buy one of these, I'm going to give you a little word of precaution. And I actually uh, tried this out and, and found out that it's true. I ordered a few of them. I ordered one that was a PEM, proton exchange membrane, and ordered one that wasn't. And I put uh, regular water in it, turned it on. This one I can't smell anything. Hydrogen is odorless. Then I smelled the other one and I could smell chlorine. It smelled like a swimming pool. If you get one like that, don't use it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> don't, don't, don't give it to your angel to drink. That's right. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad you have my But uh, backing up a little bit, um, I have been doing a lot of experimenting with this. I've also been doing a lot of reading, and there's a lot to read. They say that uh, about 10 minutes after you drink it, you feel good. Now, I had a problem because I was feeling good when I drank it. <laughs> but um, we have been experimenting on this. I'll give this just another little charge here. Have you been able to tell me, I, I've been experimenting on her for, for a few days. Um, I volunteered. <laughs> and, and you told me some interesting things. I'd like to know about your experience of drinking the hydrogen water. Well, at first I was quite skeptical. <laughs> because <Pessimistic>. Skeptic. <laughs> it, it smelled like water and it tasted a little better than water. And, and then after probably about 15 minutes, um, all of a sudden, I realized that I could feel a difference. And, and how would you describe it? Um, literally, I felt lighter. I felt a little bit... Hydrogen light. is light. <laughs> 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 no pun intended, but I did. Also, and I stopped, because I wasn't thinking about it, because mm -hmm. time had gone and I was busy doing things. And then all of a sudden, I realized, well, wait a minute. I feel a little better. And it was, it was really subtle, and then, of course, me, I'm one of those sensitive creatures, so I have to keep trying it over and over to make sure mm -hmm. it's true, <laughs> and it, I could tell a real difference. I drink more water, too, because of it. <laughs> we need to drink more water. Water is very important to human health, and we do not drink enough. And by the way, if you drink soda pop or coffee, that is not water. 
Uh, one of the reasons we need water is so that all of our systems can have the purity of that water to pull contaminants and things out of our body. And we really, really would do a lot better if we drink more water. So maybe this is just a way to get us to drink more water. But some really interesting studies. There was one Japanese study put out by a company that makes medicine for chemotherapy. And obviously, if they've got a chemotherapy drug, they don't need something that they need to compete with that's this inexpensive. because something that's just very, very cheap. Anybody can afford it. But they reported that it completely cured the cancer. They did add that they would recommend you use this along with their medicine. <laughs> but just think, what, what if this really can eradicate the, the problem of cancer cells misbehaving. And there's some, some really good science behind that. A lot of people have migraine headaches. And again, it goes back to this same kind of thing. Uh, why is it that a couple hundred years ago, people didn't have all of these kinds of sicknesses that we have today? Something has changed. And one researcher that uh, you can listen to in depth if you want to, because he's got a one-hour YouTube video that's really quite informative. But uh, his theory is that the human body was designed to produce about 12 liters of hydrogen a day. Now, when I heard that, I got really excited. <laughs> 12 liters of hydrogen. I can run my car, a little car. One Johnny size would run a long time on it. But... Uh, when he explained what we do with the hydrogen, that kind of bothered me a little bit. He says it's called flatulence. <laughs> you know, okay. We do produce gas, but he said that we have messed up our body's ability to produce our hydrogen because it's produced in the intestine. And if you take a course of antibiotic, for example, it kills the flora or the friendly bacteria inside your digestive system and it takes over a year for that to grow back. And so when it doesn't grow back, you don't have that hydrogen in your system that is used to neutralize as an antioxidant these free radicals that are growing up in your cells. Now that kind of makes sense if you think about it. But the idea that you can drink hydrogen water and be healthier, you know, it's like one of those too good to be true things. But what if it isn't? And there is a lot of, a lot of science now that's coming behind this. Uh, I think a lot of people maybe ought to try this. It, it's early. The, the mechanisms of exactly how and why it works have not been well established. So the science is still pretty early. But the studies that I saw indicate that there is an effect. And it's very, very real. Uh, I read about one study where they injected uh, Alzheimer's into a rat. They'd, they'd done a lot of testing on animals with this, and it cured it just by letting it drink the hydrogen water. Um, most of the studies have you drinking about a liter of hydrogen water a day. A liter is, you know, it's like a quart. And so this thing is 300 ml. I'd have to drink like four of these a day to be able to get that amount. And that amount of water would be, would be very, very good for us. Other studies say a liter and a half. Uh, one guy said, maybe it's just all that water people are drinking that is making them better. <laughs> and if that's the case, well then let's you know, bring it on. But the thing is, we are too sick as a society. There's too much sickness. And there are too many people that don't feel good. Uh, another report that uh, I looked at was talking about cholesterol. People get high cholesterol and that causes heart attacks and, and it's a bad thing. Well, why do our bodies build up cholesterol? And according to this study, which end up saying that hydrogen water lowered bad cholesterol, which would be amazing. I mean, a lot of people take a lot of drugs for that and they only work so-so. What if you could drink hydrogen water and it would lower your cholesterol? This report said that in our bodies, 
we have blood vessels that are made up of living cells. They all have this mitochondria. They are generating radicals which actually cause little micro cracks in the blood vessels because these cells are sick and they can't get rid of these pollutants because we don't have the hydrogen sources we used to. And so then the body coats these little cracks with cholesterol to keep the blood vessels from leaking. And when they made the, help, the cells healthy again, then the body stopped making the cholesterol. Now, that sounds pretty neat to the extent that it's true. People that are suffering from migraines, I think really ought to try this and see if it makes a difference. People that uh, are uh, autistic have said to have been able to feel a lot better from this very simple little therapy. And it's uh, one thing that the literature really, you know, whenever I see something like this, the first thing I go after is all the negative stuff. Scam unveiled. <laughs> Hydrogen water scam unveiled. That's where I searched. And um, the only things I could find is one guy says, well, maybe it's just because they drink all the water, they got better. But he did say, you know, if that's it, it's worth it. Hydrogen dissolved in water is such a low level, I don't think it's going to hurt anyone. And I really think it's, uh, I don't know, the closer you can get to hydrogen, the closer you are to heaven. They both start with H. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fire this up again for you. That's why the angels like it. Keep it, it nice right. and fresh. <laughs> this little bottle uh, you, can, you can find on the internet for $50. So they're not expensive. And there are some cheaper ones that have plastic bottles. I'd be sure and get real glass. You know, and make sure it doesn't smell like chlorine. And if it isn't, then it's not that kind. Those will probably go off the market pretty soon. If it's a plastic bottle, that would be real scary to me too uh, for these. But uh, if you don't want to do a bottle, they have another product out. And there's a lot of different brands, but they're little pills. You pull out a little teeny pill about the size of an aspirin, throw it in a cup of water, and it fizzes like an Alka-Seltzer, only an Alka-Seltzer is CO2. This fizzes hydrogen. And you make your hydrogen chemically. Uh, the one that I bought, yeah, I had to try it. <laughs> the one that I bought has magnesium in it, and the magnesium's corroding with the water, and giving, it's taking the oxygen out of the water and leaving the hydrogen. It bubbles up, three minutes, it's gone. Then you drink it. This tastes like water that doesn't, hit your stomach hard. And by the way, if I drink a lot of water, especially on an empty stomach, it kind of, <laughs> this doesn't do that. And maybe it's because the hydrogen makes the water lighter, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, what I think it does is it, it changes the alkalinity, which is why it's better for the stomach. But uh, there's, there's no taste to it, other than it's got that lightness. The magnesium pills taste like like magnesium, if everybody knows what it's almost a little bit like Alka-Seltzer or something, a little bit of that flavor, but it's not bad. And so if you're traveling, you don't have one of these with you, you can just pull out your little pill. And I think there's going to be everywhere. I think we ought to drink a whole lot less soda pop. If we would do that, this nation would be much healthier. Uh, and I'm not against soda pop companies, but I am really against a, a, a product that makes kids not feel good and, and makes them not be healthy and it really does that. And, but I think we ought to drink a lot more water and I think it would be really wonderful if we tried hydrogen water. This has absolutely boiled over in Japan. It's everywhere. If, if you go look, it, it's just a craze. It's just caught on. The Japanese version of the Food and Drug Administration has now approved hydrogen infused salt water for intravenous uh, treatments of patients and other things. I mean, it's, it's, it's real there. We have a lot of people that are attending these little discussions. Why don't we conduct an experiment? Why don't all of you try it and then let me know, good or bad, you know, how it works out. Uh, that would be a, 
pretty unbiased study. Now the real professional studies, they, they did them double blind. A double blind means that the people who are drinking the water don't know if it's the one with the hydrogen or the one without. And yet they have shown in these studies some pretty remarkable effects. So anybody who'd like to take the hydrogen challenge, here it is, drink hydrogen infused water and see if you can tell a difference. It's supposed to help you sleep better. And you can think, if, if we have these free radicals building up inside us and we get rid of them, you should just feel better. Should help you have more energy. Some people, uh, especially in Japan, say they do it as they would coffee for that boost, little boost of energy. And I haven't seen it be a boost like coffee, but it, it does give you a pick-me-up, but it's much more natural, right? How'd you say? So uh, usually I'm not one for crazes, but you know, a hydrogen craze? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> That's hard not to do. And uh, I have thoroughly tested this on an angel. I have. I have drank a lot of water. So I'm I know better that it's safe. Time. Yeah, I found out she was drinking a lot more than I knew. <laughs> and true. she's that ordered her own thing. So <laughs> hydrogen-infused <laughs> water, let's give it a try. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, we have questions. <laughs> right there, Joseph. Can we run this over to here? Take that man a microphone. All right, good. I'm going to go over here. If the hydrogen is being dissolved into the water, wouldn't the hydrogen just pick on to some of the other oxygen that are in there and just turn right back into just regular water? That's the only thing that I was confused about because I started doing research on it also, and I didn't understand like how that works exactly. All right, well, <clears throat> first of all, the oxygen in water is already combined with hydrogen. It's got two hydrogens it doesn't want anymore. If you go into the chemistry just a little bit deeper, then you know that there's always a certain number of water molecules that are ionizing, and they're breaking into the hydroxyl ion and the hydrogen positive ion, and then they go back together. And how much is in the hydrogen plus ion is what we call well, we won't get in, into the details of that, but it's the hydrogen ion, and that's something that we measure in chemistry, and acids create more hydrogen ions. But in general, the hydrogen that we put in here is just molecular hydrogen. It has both of its electrons. It doesn't give them up. It just dissolves like oxygen and nitrogen and other gases dissolve in the water, so it's, it's not reactive. Uh, some people say that it helps clean chlorine out of the water, and it may do that. Uh, and yet, uh, I don't think this is really a sterilization method. But it may be a way of getting something into your body that does clear out these free radicals as an antioxidant. One thing about hydrogen is that it's the smallest atom known to man, and it will go through very, very small openings when nothing else will. If you go get a, a toy balloon and blow it up, it might stay up for a few days. If you inflate it with hydrogen, it'll go flat in a few hours because the hydrogen diffuses out. If you notice the helium balloons, helium's twice as big as hydrogen, but still small enough to leak out of balloons. If you go get a helium balloon at the grocery store, it's a balloon that's metallized. And when you put the metal on the mylar, it helps trap these very small gases. So it gets into the cells. It gets into the bloodstream, and the people that have studied what happens, they can actually measure the hydrogen in the bloodstream after you drink this stuff. So it really does get there. Some people say, wow, uh, one and a half parts per million is not very much hydrogen. It couldn't do any good. And uh, that's an interesting argument. But if you have those radicals in your cells or your body, and you just drink a few billion hydrogen atoms, it might do some good, and over time it could accumulate. And I think you have to drink enough and do it consistent enough to really make a difference. But I kind of like the fact that we're dealing with real small amounts of hydrogen. Uh, could be a little dangerous otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it, it's still a flammable gas, okay? When, when it does come in contact, though, with an OH radical, and it does combine and it forms water. What a great way to get rid of things that are making cells sick or even killing them. And what a great way to get rid of something 
that makes cancer cells misbehave. Uh, cells have a property, an amazing property, that if there's something wrong with them, they're supposed to self-destruct. They kill themselves. But for some reason, cancer cells have forgotten how to do that, and so they get way out of control. And uh, again, one study, I, I haven't studied these studies, I'm just reading them, but one study says that in the case of cancer, the hydrogen ion, or not ions, the hydrogen molecules, get rid of the radicals, which then make the cells remember we're sick, and they put out their lights. So if, if this is even remotely like they're saying in the literature, this is something we all need to be aware of. And I'll tell you what, the researchers that are putting out these papers are pretty impressive. So I think we ought to look at it real careful. The other thing I like about it is I don't see anybody in this literature that's out to make money. You know, if, if I'm going to make money, this is the best microphone in the world. Who sells them? Oh, I do. <laughs> uh, beware, beware. But when you have something that, uh, you know, anybody can afford something like this. I mean, this can put out lots and lots and lots of bottles of water, just a pill uh, that costs a few cents, whereas a drug to lower your cholesterol can cost a fortune per pill. So just think. Uh, the guy that uh, wrote that initial paper was named Dr. Ota. And by the way, if you look at the paper, I think there's eight authors, but he's the last one. And he's the one that's really, I think, the spearhead behind that paper. But he said that if you drink the hydrogen water once a day, that it has an effect all day. And I think what he was trying to tell us is that if you get rid of those radicals, then all day those cells are going to be healthy until they build up the next day. He says you ought to take a drink every day. They have spas now over in Tokyo, if you happen to be over there. I know some of our students are in Tokyo. Greetings, you know about this. Ah, uh, Swissel, by the way, hydrogen, just so they know. But uh, they have spas where you can go take a, a hydrogen hot tub. They literally put hydrogen in the water and it bubbles around and uh, supposed to help take out aging marks, sunspots, things like that, and diffuse into your skin. The studies, though, that I read say that the hot tubs do not get as much hydrogen into your bloodstream as the water does. Uh, probably goes in through the cells, but you want to get it into the circulatory system. So drinking it gets it in the digestive system and gets it in the capillaries, and away we go. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, due to how you said it uh, works with salt water, have they had any studies to uh, what its effect might be on plankton or sea life of any kind? Well, if, uh, if you electrolyze seawater, you get chlorine. But of course, that's just one way of making it. You could probably use the pills with salt water just fine and it still make hydrogen. It's only electrolysis that's going to produce the chlorine. But um, the dissolved hydrogen would probably be very good for plankton, I would think. Uh, what idea did you have about that? Uh, I was just considering how uh, they could infuse, like, per se, uh, freshwater lake with uh, like the bubblers, like a hydrogen bubbler, and increase the life of that lake or the ocean mother, you know, whatever life may live in that lake. What a fascinating idea. So you all heard that, infuse uh, a lake with hydrogen bubbles, and what would it do to that lake? Well now let's think about a minute. It should have an impact on plankton, which are one-celled creatures, and they have the mitochondria, they, they could benefit but it could also impact the fish. It could make a lot of things a lot healthier, maybe make fish taste better. Yeah, it might, but it may make them healthier, and healthier does taste better. So it's fascinating to know where it can go. Um, algae is, uh, is a very interesting thing uh, that is extremely important to our life here on this earth. A lot of the oxygen that we breathe comes from algae that grows in the ocean. And during, especially the winter months, there's a lot of areas 
that uh, they get very wild seas. And these big wild seas stir up the dirt and the dust and they get the fertilizer in the water so that it has the nitrogen and the chemicals that are needed for these uh, algae to be able to grow. And then when it starts getting warm enough, they get what's called an algae bloom. And if you've seen some of the satellite or aerial pictures around Africa, when they have these algae blooms, it's like huge portions of the or ocean turn green from this big growth of algae. And that algae is then what feeds a lot of the one-celled animals and eventually the wells and it's kind of the source of a lot of food for sea life. But that algae bloom takes in CO2 and puts out oxygen. And it puts out uh, more oxygen than the Amazon rainforest annually. It's, and, and that's a huge rainforest, by the way. So it's very, very important. Sometimes algae blooms are talked about as being dangerous because there is so much. They, uh, they actually will suffocate wildlife because they grow so vigorously. And that's like down in Mississippi where all of our fertilizer we put on our farms washes off in the floods, goes down into the ocean and gets out of control. But uh, it's an interesting thought. Our, our planet is sick. And our planet is sick because we've made some mistakes. We've overused certain things. We have mercury in our tuna in the ocean. And a lot of that is traced back to the California gold rush. When we were producing all of that gold and we use mercury to refine it, it'd end up in the streams go out in the ocean. Uh, it, it now is there and it gets concentrated in these tuna and it's, it's a serious problem. We have uh, things like chloridane. Chloridane is a, a, a spray that really kills bugs. If you don't like bugs, spray your house with chloridane around your house and you won't see bugs for three or four months. But chloridane doesn't break down, that's why it was so neat. But the problem is it ends up in the streams, it ends up in the water table, it doesn't break down. And so that becomes a problem. So there's a lot of things we've done to control infestations of insects, to control weeds, to do things that are helping us on the one hand that end up sometimes backfiring. We have a lot of uh, processed foods that we eat. Processed foods are often made a thousand or more miles away from where we consume them. So to keep them from spoiling, we inject preservatives. And preservatives are things that kill bacteria. And if they kill bacteria, I wonder how good they are in our digestive system and what they're doing to our bodies. There are too many people sick. And it's got to be that we're making some mistakes. Just air pollution by itself is a big factor. If you live and breathe all that air pollution, you're doing a lot of damage to the cells in your lungs. Uh, people have known for a long time that if you're around someone that's, that's a heavy smoker, that if you'll take a lot of vitamin C, which is a strong antioxidant, it will help your body recover from the damage caused by the smoke and, and you'll remain healthier. Well, the same is true about being in pollution. And now they're talking about this hydrogen being a antioxidant that can go in and get rid of those radicals that build up in the body. And it might help us live a lot more healthy in this environment we've created. Uh, I still think we should do everything we can to improve our environment, but at the same time, wouldn't it be nice if we could get feeling better? I lived, oh, this is going to scare some of you, but I lived during the 50s. I know, and I'm not talking the 2050s here. <laughs> uh, I can remember the 50s. I can't remember them all because I was too young, but I can remember 1955, 56, 57, 58. I can remember those years. And the attitude of people was different than it is today. People were nicer. And now everybody's right on the edge of running you off the road. The way I drive, it happens to me a lot. <laughs> but uh, we really need to realize that when people don't feel good, they get grouchy. And uh, I have been a big fan 
of feeling good for a long time. Some of you have heard the story about Dr. Emmanuel Cheraskin. Dr. Cheraskin is a, a gentleman that has passed away in recent years at late 80s in age, but he was a professor of medicine at the University of Georgia. And he was the guy that did all of these studies on vitamin C and how it would help you fight disease and it would repair damage to your cells, etc. But I came across a book years ago, and in the book, it gave a report of a formulation of vitamins and minerals that Dr. Cheraskin had developed that he said you should take every day to fill your best. And those words really caught my attention, to fill my best. That's what I want. Dr. Cheraskin said that, you know, when you get a bottle of vitamins, it says 100 of the USA daily requirement. And that's how much you have to have or you get sick. If you don't have that much vitamin C, you'll get rickets, okay? That's not a very good standard to choose how many vitamins to take. I want, a, I want his standard. His standard says, I formulated it to help you fill your best. And he didn't have enough white rice, uh, excuse me, white mice, <laughs> and so instead he used dentists for his experiments. That's right, he had a group of 10,000 dentists nationwide that he gave his magic concoctions to, and he says, I chose dentists because they're usually the kind of people that will take the vitamins and that will report to me how they did, and they're pretty scientific, so they can, they can tell me how they did. So he did this for 40 years and he developed this formulation and here was the book and he says if you take these you're going to fill your best. So I ran right over to Walgreens, opened the book, got my little cart, went down the aisle and started trying to find each of the things so that I could take what he said and I, I got like 15 bottles in my cart but half the things I couldn't find. And so that's when, like Mr. Goodyear, I should have given up. But instead, I went home and I called him on the telephone. And I got through to the university and he came on the phone. He was retired, he'd been retired for years. But he was Professor Emeritus and he happened to be there. And I said, yeah, I wanna take these vitamins and minerals to fill my best, but I can't find out where to buy them. Where do you get them? And he says, well, that's the sad part. After my study ended, nobody's making them. I just had them made for me, but now nobody's making them. And I said, you're kidding. You got something that doesn't really work? Oh, yeah. And I says, well, if I make them, will you help me? And so he did. He helped me find the suppliers. He helped me with the formulations. And I found a little company in Richmond, Missouri that makes pills. And I went up there and I said, will you make these for me? And they did. And so I started getting these little vitamins. And I tried them out on Angel. I still take them. Yeah. As and a they, research experiment. And they work. <laughs> they do. They make you feel better. She, she's, by the way, really good at these kinds of experiments. Well, I like it. I'm a yeah, it's very simple. But I also tried out on... A lot of our students and friends and everybody, you know, free vitamins and minerals. <laughs> One of the reasons why I got interested in these is it got to the point, it seemed like I was having a cold or the flu, and I don't know how you can tell the difference, but I was having it every month. If it takes two or three weeks to get over, it means I had one good week in between each bout, and I hated it. I was so tired of the flu. And vitamin C was supposed to help, so I was reading about that, and that's when I found out about Cheraskin, and then I found his magic formulation. And now, I've been taking this formulation for uh, over, well, almost two decades. And I take it faithfully. And I have maybe one or two colds a year. And I like that a whole lot better. And I really blame these things. And I do feel better. In fact, I actually feel uh, more alive, uh, more energy than I did when I started taking them. So I, I owe him a lot. 
One of our graduate students here did a whole study on these and uh, wrote up a dissertation on it. But they're, they're really a neat thing. So I'm very interested in things that help us feel our best. I think this is pretty big. You need to eat right. Eating right is important and supplements can help you get the stuff that your diet doesn't help you get. But this is another real important thing and I, I think we ought to look at it very seriously. Uh, my initial reaction, and I haven't known about it very long, but my initial reaction is it's real. And if it is, it's going to be one of the big health things to come along. The part of America that has really jumped on this and is really using it are the, uh, the athletes that do extensive training. If you work out right to your limit, it does a lot of damage to your cells. And they found that they can keep going if they drink the hydrogen water right after the workout. And to me, that is a great testimony that there's something to it. So try it out and see what you think. I, I still think you got to exercise. I still think you need the good diet and they, plenty of water. Of course, maybe this will help us drink water, but you also need good rest. A lot of people are having a hard time resting. Wouldn't it be great if, like they say, this helps you rest? And uh, it'd be interesting to know if any of you try it, what kind of results you get. So hydrogen-infused water, hydrogen water, it's easy to find everywhere, like I say, it's Walmart's picked up on it, Amazon, all the places. And I'm not trying to sell something, I'm just trying to find out, is this really something that will make life better? And if it does, we ought to be all over it. You know, when I was very young, I, I fell in love with hydrogen because it was a way you could burn something and get energy to run a car or a bus or whatever, and the only byproduct was pure water. And to me, that was just so perfect. And now to think that you can run your angels on, on this stuff. <laughs> Makes us nicer, more heavenly. <laughs> yeah. Less fiery. Yeah. <laughs> Won't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is kind of an exciting technology to look into, and I think we should. And if, if I'm right, if there's some real science involved here, and it really does make a difference, in 10 years, this is going to be something that will be well known. We do need to feel better and we need to have more health as a society. Something's really wacky. It really is. There's so many diseases that are just getting so prominent and, and we've got to figure out why and stop it. Okay. Two questions. One is how long does it stay in the water, the hydrogen? The other one is if they were to light a match over, would it be combustible? Please... Uh, consider expelling that second one. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's just a joke. It's just a joke. I, I feel that student, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> Close to my heart. The answer to the question is, if you put a lid on it, the hydrogen will stay in the water a lot longer, especially if it's almost full. If there's not a place for the hydrogen to escape in the air above it. But they say you should drink it within two hours. And if you don't, you recharge it. And it's just the amount of dissolved oxygen that's in there. Um, if you can get about, and by the way, you can get little meters to measure the dissolved oxygen if you want to, but you want to have about one and a half parts per million. There are some units that just big cloud of hydrogen and they claim they can get over two parts per million. We'll get one of those or drink two of these. I mean, it's basically the same result. So about uh, two hours but putting a lid on it, you can probably keep it throughout the day. <clears throat> and as far as what would happen if you light it on fire, well, that gets real interesting. First of all, these are very small bubbles, and you have a very, very, very small amount of hydrogen when it comes to making a flame. On the other hand, yes, and, and be careful. In some of these units, you have hydrogen and oxygen both coming out of here. That's kind of interesting. Some. The oxygen vents out the bottom and the hydrogen vents out the top. So if you caught this, captured it like in a balloon or something, you could get a pop. And yeah, it is an electrolyzer. The good news is it's a very, 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 very small quantity. Take a long time to blow up a balloon. So um, you know, hydrogen is a, is a fuel and it needs to be respected. But isn't it interesting 
that it is non-toxic, is completely non-toxic. Now, if, if we could build up enough here and I could breathe it, I could do the little Mickey Mouse thing, couldn't I? You know, where you, you breathe in and it changes your voice. But I don't think I got quite enough here. If I actually were to drink most of this, get a little more space, let it run and run and run, build up a hydrogen, <laughs> then I could talk Mickey Mouse. Man. I thought about doing some of that, and then I thought, maybe not tonight. <laughs> it is fun. So uh, here's to a healthier new world and to hydrogen or anything else that Dr. Cheraskin or anyone else can help us, can do to help us fill our best. Yes, right here. I want to pass that mic over to him. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of sources. Uh, are they linked anywhere online that we can easily access? Or? Yeah, uh, our friends over at Google linked them. <laughs> Just search hydrogen water, hydrogen water bottle, and there they are. Uh, the, the place that uh, was real easy to find them, if you go on Google or Amazon and search hydrogen water bottle, there's a whole slug of them. Uh, it, it was really surprising to me to see there were so many already. Uh, if you happen to be an AliExpress user, uh, you can get one of these for $30, but they ship them from China. You have to wait a month. But uh, yeah, they're, they're really proliferating. And there's all kinds in Japan. That's where this is really taking root. Okay, anybody else? Okay, well, drink hydrogen, live long and prosper. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a great night. We'll see you next week.